So I'd like to start by saying it's a real pleasure to be here with you today and I'm really looking forward to the workshop. It's a shame we're not in person. I'd much prefer to be in Loughborough seeing you all rather than talking to my screen, but we have to make the most of where we are. So my talk is about changing the obesity narrative and it's really going to be focused on kind of what patients need and why we need to do it. So it is, will be quite clinically focused. So why do we need to do this? Why do we need to change the obesity narrative? Well, at the moment, we have a massive increase in our understanding over the last 20 years of the science of how appetite and body weight are regulated. And then there's this void and public opinion the media and politicians. So there's a disconnect between what we've learned and what we all study and what scientists and um, professionals understand versus what's put out by the pub to the public and in the newspapers every day. So we really need to change the obesity narrative for the benefit of the public and also patients. So let's start off with some facts and figures, which I'm sure you're all aware of. So more than half of the global population are living with either overweight or obesity. And these numbers continue to rise globally. There isn't one single country that has managed to stop the year on year increase in the prevalence of overweight and obesity. And if you look at this slide, it just highlights the regions where the prevalence is greater. So the mid orange color is where 20 to 29% of the population are living with obesity. And the dark orange color, so most of America and also the Middle East, is where more than 30% of the country, of the, of the people in the country are living with obesity. But obesity isn't a new problem. If we actually go back, Hippocrates was the first to realize that people who were very fat were more apt to die quickly than those who were thin. He also realized that obesity led to infertility and early mortality. So this is not a new problem. But it wasn't until 1997 that the WHO um, set a international obesity task force and they generated this report, which was entitled preventing and managing the global epidemic. Now remember this is 1997. And in this report, they stated obesity was a disease, a complex, incompletely understood, serious and chronic condition, and that it needed prevention and management strategies at both the individual and societal level. Now I would argue we've made very little progress um, since 1997. So let's look at the definition. So the WHO gave their first definition of obesity in 2000, and they said it was a disease in which excess body fat has accumulated to such an extent that health may be adversely affected. So this is really important. It's not just body fat, it's the impact of this body fat on a person's health. And they sort of underscored the practical use of body mass index to be used at a population level. And if we use BMI, then we can classify people as underweight, normal weight, overweight, or to have obesity with three different classes. Now these cutoffs are lowered by 2.5 units for people from an Asian background. So why does obesity matter? Obesity impacts upon every organ system in the body. In particular, it's the metabolic effects of obesity that drive ill health. For example, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, fatty liver, infertility, and cancers. But then there's also the mechanical effect on the body of carrying around excess adipose tissue, which impacts on the joints, contributes to sleep apnea and impairs a person's physical functioning. Then we mustn't forget the CNS effects of obesity. We know that people with obesity 
have an increased prevalence of depression and anxiety. Now, we also know there's sort of a dose response relationship between these obesity com related complications and body mass index. So as BMI goes up, then the prevalence of um, coronary heart disease, hypertension, type two diabetes, and fatty liver also go up. And if we look at obesity associated cancers, then again, as BMI increases, then the risk of these cancers also increases. Note this slide is only showing us BMI up to 30. So as we go from BMI 25 to 30, then the risk of these obesity related cancers increases. Now, as David already said in the introduction, we know that people with severe obesity are at greater risk from COVID-19. Now, we don't entirely understand the biology behind this, but we know that people with obesity have altered immune response. They also have low-grade systemic inflammation as a consequence of their dysfunctional adipose tissue. Often many people will have reduced respiratory reserve, and if you put that together with the obesity-associated comorbidities, then it's this altered biology that is driving an increased infection rate, increased hospital admission, increased ICU, and also increased mortality. There's another component to this, and that is that people with obesity often delay seeking medical health due to weight stigma. And this is something that I'll come on to later. So these are the kind of suggested reasons why people with obesity are at more risk. The other factor is that the um, ACE2 receptor by which the SARS virus gets into the body is highly expressed on adipose tissue. So there's an idea that maybe people with obesity have an increased viral reservoir. So, why is obesity so bad for us? Well, the primary problem is due to adipocytes. So adipocytes produce a myriad of biologically active um, proteins, um, adipokines and cytokines. And as a person develops obesity, then there's a switch in the adipokine and cytokine secretion profile. So this becomes pro-inflammatory. In particular, there's an increase in TNF-alpha and IL-6 and a decrease in adiponectin. So if we look at this in a bit more detail as to how increasing adipose tissue leads to common chronic diseases. So we have an increase in adiposity, the adipose tissue becomes infiltrated with macrophages and inflammatory cells. We get a change in the cytokines, which leads to impaired insulin signaling insulin resistance and drives type 2 diabetes. The adipose tissue also changes its lipid production, so we have an increased release of free fatty acids, which lead to lipotoxicity and dyslipidemia. These together with the insulin resistance drive fatty liver disease, coronary heart disease, stroke and also kidney disease. There's also an activation of the sympathetic nervous system and an increase in the activity of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which also drives um, pulmonary and, syst and systemic hypertension. Then the mechanical stress of the excess body weight impacts upon joints, raises intra-abdominal pressure, affects the um, pharynx, so we end up with obstructive sleep apnea, osteoarthritis, and also problems in the esophagus. So the primary driver of all of this is the increased adipose tissue. Now, I've already um, sort of highlighted the comorbidities that come with obesity, but these comorbidities mean that people with obesity die at an earlier age. A person with a BMI of 40 only has a 50% chance of reaching the age of 70. So when we're treating people with obesity, we really need to think about improving their health and also increasing their life expectancy and their quality of life. So as I mentioned earlier, 
BMI is not a great marker at the level of an individual. We need to look at waist circumference, we need to see where fat is deposited. But when we're thinking about targeting people to treat, then we need to use staging systems. And one of the most common systems used is the Edmonton Obesity Staging System. And when this is used to look at mortality, then the EAR score is a much better predictor of mortality than BMI. So EOS is on the left and um, BMI is on the right and EOS is much greater at predicting mortality. So therefore in the clinical situation, it helps us to decide who we need to target earliest. So the good news is that weight loss leads to improved health. However, we now know that we need different amounts of weight loss to impact on the different comorbidities of obesity. So if we want to cause type two diabetes remission, we need to be engendering 15% weight loss or more. The same if we want to impact on cardiovascular disease and NASH. Whereas we do know that smaller amounts of weight loss can improve high blood pressure and high glucose but the levels that we need to be achieving to impact on the more serious complications of obesity are double digit and much higher. So in order to develop effective treatments for people with obesity, we need to understand how body weight is regulated. Lots of people think it's simple, energy in, energy out. But if it was that simple, then we wouldn't be um, having a global epidemic. The regulation or the maintenance of adequate energy intake is essential for survival. So during the course of evolution, we have developed multiple systems that ensure that we eat. There are homeostatic signals that come from adipose tissue, the GI tract and the pancreas that act upon the hypothalamus and the brainstem to regulate energy intake. Now these are all focused on making us eat rather than stopping us eating. Through transgenic mice and genetic mutations in humans, we have a really good understanding of the neuronal level of appetite regulation. So if we look at the hypothalamus, the arcuate nucleus is a key region. This acts as the first point which the signals from the body act upon the brain. So we have NPY neurons coded green and POMC neurons coded red. The NPY neuron inhibits the POMC neuron. So satiety peptides activate the POMC neuron, whereas the hunger um, signal ghrelin activates the NPY neuron. The um, adiposity signals leptin and insulin activate POMC. When we activate the POMC, acting via the MC3 and MC4 receptor, then we end up with satiety and a decrease in appetite. Conversely, when we activate the MPY neuron, then we end up with hunger and an increase in appetite. The brainstem also plays a key role, receiving information from the gut in the form of vagal afferents, but also satiety peptides and also adiposity signals. The brainstem controls gastric emptying, metabolic rate, and therefore impacts upon feeding. There's also an important crosstalk between the hypothalamus and the brainstem. So these homeostatic signals drive the feeling of hunger and satiety. However, in our current environment, most of us don't eat because we're hungry. We eat because of social factors, because of food cues, because of emotions. We also eat because food tastes really great and is very rewarding. A person's susceptibility to these hedonic drivers of food intake depends upon their genetics and their epigenetics. Over the last 30 years, we've come to realize that the gut plays a critical role in regulating energy and glucose homeostasis. There are a panoply of different hormones that come from the gut and together with the microbiome, the enteric nervous system and bile acids, 
they play a critical role in regulating body weight and also glucose. The um, images on this slide highlight that gut hormones not only act upon the hypothalamus and the brainstem, but also on the reward and executive regions of the brain. So the left-hand side of this slide shows you what happens when we use functional brain imaging and infuse peptide YY, a satiety hormone. Whereas the right-hand side is the response of the brain to endogenous changes in ghrelin. So both the hunger hormone and satiety hormones act upon homeostatic and reward regions of the brain. And this makes them very tract um, tractable therapies for treating obesity. Gut hormones also act on many other parts of the body. They impact upon the pancreas, the liver, muscle, adipose tissue, and also regulate taste. So to pull all of this together, we have a myriad of signals coming from the periphery that act through the hypothalamus and the brainstem out to the higher regions of the brain to determine eating behavior. But it's even more complicated than that. These are the pathways um, that we learned back in biochemistry for how metabolism is regulated. And we, when we look at the complexity, it's hardly surprising that there's never gonna be a single magic bullet that works for everybody. And we also need to think not just about biology, but the environment that a person is within. And this is the diagram from the Foresight Report, really illustrating that we need a whole systems approach when we're thinking about the prevention and treatment of obesity. There's also not just one type of obesity, there are multiple types of obesity, and we need to get much better at actually phenotyping patients and treating them. So what about the genetics of body weight regulation? Well, if we go back and think how um, our environment has changed, if we think about the majority of human evolution, food has been scarce. It's only in the last 100 years that food has been re readily available. So it was an evolutionary advantage if you had genes that allowed you to consume a large amount of energy. So over the course of evolution, we have selected for genes that encourage us to eat and also to conserve energy. The problem is our environment has changed, but our mechanisms that regulate body weight haven't. Another real key threat to survival was a famine or starvation. And we've developed powerful mechanisms to protect against famines and starvations. Unfortunately, a diet to the body is the modern day equivalent of a starvation or a famine. So in terms of genetic mutations that cause obesity, there are some rare monogenic causes of obesity that have really helped us to understand part of the pathway that I showed you earlier. But these causes of obesity are incredibly rare and usually present early in childhood. However, we do know that body weight is highly heritable, as you'll see from these twin studies illustrated here. So on the left-hand side are identical twins, and on the right-hand side are non-identical twins. And we know that identical twins are far more similar in terms of energy intake, satiety, and basal metabolic response. We also understand a lot more about the genetic architecture of body weight regulation. These are data from Sadaf Faruqi's lab, and they found that people who were naturally very thin had fewer genetic variants that are known to increase the risk of becoming overweight. Whereas people with obesity had an increased number of the genetic variants linked to becoming overweight. Well, how do these genetic variants impact upon body weight. So I want to just illustrate one of these, which is FTO. So FTO was identified in 2007. One in 16 of the general population have two copies of the at-risk variant. 
and children and adults with the at-risk variant of this SNP have increased food intake and increased appetite. So we undertook a study in normal weight UCL students to look at how um, people who had two copies of this risk SNP behaved when we gave them a meal. And what we found is that um, AAs, who are the at-risk group, when we gave them a meal, their hunger didn't suppress to the same extent as the TTs. And when we looked at gut hormones, we found a difference in ghrelin. So even though these two groups are matched completely, the AA students didn't suppress their ghrelin or their hunger to the same extent. And when we undertook brain imaging, their brain really responded or lit up like a Christmas tree when we showed them high energy dense food. So just this change in one SNP can change hunger, ghrelin, and also how the brain responds. We also know that when a person develops obesity, their biology changes. The signaling from the gut is impaired. They have an altered gut microbiome. They develop leptin and insulin resistance. There's a change in the brain structure. And also there's a change in the connectivity within the brain and an enhanced brain response to food cues. These factors all drive increased energy intake. Now, what about treating people with obesity? We have great guidelines from NICE as to how we should be doing this. And these are based on adding in pharmacotherapy for people with a BMI of 27 or more, and also bariatric surgery. But the cornerstone to obesity management is diet, physical activity, and behavior therapy. Just to add in that most of the new pharmacotherapy are focused on harnessing the body's own appetite regulating system. So what happens when a person goes on a diet? All diets, if the person sticks to them, engender weight loss, as illustrated by this slide. The difficulty is maintaining weight loss. And we know that the vast majority of people will put weight back on over four to seven years. Now, why is this? So as soon as a person goes on a diet, then there's an increase in ghrelin, the hunger hormone. There's a reduction in satiety hormones, a reduction in energy expenditure. And if we undertake brain imaging, there's a change in the way the brain responds to food cues. So these compensatory biological changes underlie the reason why most people regain weight that they've lost. So what about pharmacotherapy? Well, to date, pharmacotherapy has been relatively limited. So Orlistat, which reduces fat absorption from the gut, naltrexone, bupropion, which acts on the brain, and liraglutide, which is a GLP-1 receptor um, agonist. At best, these drugs cause about five to 7% weight loss. But as I mentioned at the outset, we need more than that but I'm going to sh show you some exciting new data from a new um, GLP-1 receptor agonist called semaglutide. So these data aren't published yet, but they are available in abstract form. And that exciting finding here is that over 50% of people treated are achieving 15% weight loss or more, the magic number needed for type two diabetes remission. And if you combine semaglutide with an intensive behavioral therapy, then 65% of participants are achieving 15% um, weight loss or more. So there's some real excitement with regards to pharmacotherapy. So what about bariatric surgery? So at the moment, bariatric surgery is the most effective treatment for people with severe obesity, as illustrated by this slide, out to 20 years. Um, bariatric surgery produces marked health benefits with resolution or remission of the majority of the complications of type 2 of obesity and an overall 40% decrease in mortality. And for type 2 diabetes, it reduces the long term complications. So the health benefits to bariatric surgery are to the individual, 
but also much wider if we can understand how bariatric surgery engenders these effects, then we can develop new treatments for treating people with obesity and, and type 2 diabetes. So how does bariatric surgery work? Well, the main mechanism is it alters how nutrients and biliary um, fluids flow through the GI tract. And as a consequence of that, it alters all of the GI signals that come from the gut that regulate appetite. So bariatric surgery does cause a degree of restriction, but patients feel reduced hunger, increased satiety, they have changes in taste and smell, they have altered food preference, a reduced interest in food. So when we look at taste, they have a switch from high fat and high sugar away to low sugary and low fat. And when we look at long-term outcome, we know that patients with the greater changes in taste have greater weight loss. After bariatric surgery, there are also marked changes in the brain. And these brain changes occur relatively early after surgery. And they basically correct the problems compared to normal weight people that we see in people with obesity. So bariatric surgery corrects the obesogenic biology. It changes all of the gut hormones, the gut microbiome, it restores leptin and insulin resistance and changes the brain back to how it would be in a normal weight person. And this is why bariatric surgery leads to long-term weight loss maintenance. Now, we don't exactly know how it works. There are many things that happen when we replumb a person's GI tract. So all of these contribute. However, there is a variation in response to bariatric surgery. And we know that this is due to a different effect of the gut on the biology after bariatric surgery. We also know that genetics play a key role in this variability. So this study from Lee Kaplan's group shows you that weight loss after bariatric surgery is 70% heritable. We also know that people with a poor response after surgery have a, a less of a um, favorable change in their appetite. So the people with a poor response have increased hunger and reduced satiety. And when we look at gut hormones, then people with a poor response have a lower change in their PYY and GLP-1. So it seems that gut hormones play a key role in driving the benefits of bariatric surgery. There are also marked differences between the two key operations. And this allows us to really interrogate the gut and use bariatric surgery as a research tool to understand how the gut regulates body weight and blood glucose. Almost there, just a few more slides. So we also know that there's a wide variation in weight loss with any intervention that we use, be it diet, drugs, or surgery. So any intervention has risks and benefits, and then there's a health improvement, but this is dependent upon the biology of the person and also the environment in which the person lives. We also know that initial weight loss will, on, with any intervention determines long-term weight loss. And this is important because it means that we can identify people who are not responding early and we need to step in and switch treatments when people aren't responding. So we have this stepwise treatment strategy, starting off with professionally directed lifestyle changes, pharmacotherapy, weight loss surgery, and then also post-surgery combinations, so adding in pharmacotherapy. So obesity is a complex, multifactorial disease with signals from the gut, regulating appetite, signals from the periphery. But then there's an interaction with genetics and the environment that really alter people's predisposition to developing obesity. Now, I just want to touch on weight bias and weight stigma because people with obesity face substantial weight bias and stigma 
and this actually really contributes to their ill health. The concept that shaming person, a person will help them to lose weight is absolutely incorrect. And we know that obesity stigma causes an increase in cortisol, a stress response, and drives an increase in body weight. So we really need to be using person-first language. And also there was a consensus published by Nature Medicine to do with ending obesity stigma. So to come back to where I started, we have science, we've had a massive increase in our understanding of how body weight is regulated and that obesity is um, difficult to manage and treat. But then we have public opinion that's in our papers every day that impacts upon the people who live with obesity. So I just want to say, so, um, finish by saying, I really urge you all to think about your research in the context of people living with obesity, and also to think about how you can get the message out that obesity is just not lack of willpower, and the mantra of eat less and move more is not going to help people who are living with obesity. We need to acknowledge the biology of obesity and work with it and increase our understanding of why it's so hard to maintain weight loss. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Rachel, thank you um, very much. That was an absolutely outstanding introduction to, to our workshop. Um, I don't know how you managed to cover so much information. Um, it's almost like a whole curriculum, but you've done it with great clarity and really given us a, a, a superb overview. And I see you're getting some hand claps there um, from our, from our um, participants. I'm sorry so we, I didn't cover exercise, David, but I didn't think have time <laughs> to put that in. <laughs> that, that, that's no problem. I'm sure we'll talk about that this afternoon, but it, it really was a, a fantastic overview, Rachel, and uh, it's quite humbling listening to you speak. So thank you very much. Um, I can see you've put a lot of effort into that. Um, we have about 20 minutes now for questions. So um, we, if you want to ask a question, if please use the hand function. Carolyn and I will try and make sure we... Um, we, we chaperone that and so everybody gets to ask their, their question um so please go ahead um those of you that have questions to ask i think ben ben's got a question thank you thank you rachel um, so i'm ben kelly i'm the director of clinical research at uh, nuffield health um i really pick up on that point about the void um but not just in the piece around the research and the media but also in clinical practice as well yeah. particularly in practice where um, obesity isn't that particular focus of that clinic or that or that clinician and the question I have really is how do we get to a point where we have a set of tools or a a route in which we can start to define what is right for a patient at a given time if they're presenting um, for a condition or set of conditions that isn't you know primarily focused on the obesity for example chronic pain yeah. Um, from my experience, you know, it is uncoordinated and we've got a lot of um, innovation on the research side that isn't being translated into clinic, particularly uh, in primary care. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on what those first yeah. steps might be for those particular cases. So we have a massive am amount of education to do, starting, as you say, with primary care. Um, primary care nurses, often the person that, um, person that most patients see, and to really kind of get across the idea that every single consultation we should be discussing weight because it's an opportunity for health. And there is an, a, a sort of a push from that from the government. And I've given two talks in the last week to GP um, audiences. I think a lot of GPs are worried about offending their patients. So they're worried about offending them by talking about weight. Whereas actually the vast majority of patients with overweight and obesity are relieved. So it's just a question about educating GPs and hospital doctors how to broach the topic of obesity in a sensitive, dignified way and ask permission. So just ask the patient, uh, would you mind if we talk about your weight today? Or I notice you're carrying around some extra weight. Would it be okay if we discuss that? If they say no, then say, okay, well, we'll talk about that when you're ready. But at least broach the topic 
And I think part of the problem is that there's a lack of services to refer people to. So as a GP, if you've got a patient in front of you and you're going to talk about their weight, unless you've got somewhere to send them and treatment options, then what can you do? Because doctors don't like not being able to treat things. They'd rather ignore it. So again, it's, it's a combination of sort of raising obesity is not personal responsibility as a disease, um, teaching people how to actually raise the topic sensitively, and then also having effective treatment strategies. So we are moving forward in terms of we've got the diabetes prevention program, we've now got soup and a shake being rolled out, but that's only for a minority of people. Um, particularly to do with type 2 diabetes. So again, once we have more effective weight management strategies and drugs, then it will be a game changer to actually have an effective treatment that can engender 15, 20% weight loss will make a big difference. But it's education, education, education. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I think we've got a question now from Bridget Benel. And Bridget, it's nice to have you with us today. And Bridget's from the British Nutrition Foundation. Hi there, thanks Rachel for a really brilliant presentation. Mm -hmm. um, as David said, we're, uh, the BNF, we are often in the position of talking to the media and trying to give sensible messages about these kinds of things. Um, obesity is something we find really challenging to talk about, um, to be able to get across the, the real benefits of losing weight, but in the context of how challenging it can be to lose weight and also trying to avoid stigmatizing. As you've said, I wondered if you had any top tips on the kind of language to use um, and also any organizations that you might recommend working with in terms of getting the patient voice on obesity. Yeah, so Obesity Empowerment Network UK, um, again, they've got lots of obesity champions who would kind of sense check what you're writing or be happy mm -hmm. to give um, a voice of people living with obesity. I think the key is person first language and our government doesn't do that. Public Health England sends out messages that aren't um, person first language. So, and that's something that we're really trying to push against. So it's, I agree it's hard because any weight loss benefit is good. And the same with physical activity. Increasing physical activity is good for your overall health but it's incredibly difficult once you've reached a BMI of 40 to actually reduce that down yourself. So I think there's different messages for the whole population, which is the people who are sort of BMI up to 30. Mm -hmm. We all need to think a, bit, a little bit more about what is healthy weight and activity. But for the group who already have sort of severe obesity, then that's the group that really need to have specialized support, mm -hmm. and not be left stuck trying to do something. And one of the biggest problems is that we don't switch when something's not working. We kind of leave patients on a diet that's not working for six months, whereas we actually know by eight weeks if it's going to work or not. And if it's not working, do something different. Okay, I, I can't see any other questions at the minute. Oh, so There is somebody else actually, Okay, David. okay. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Madronika Sarju. I have uh, one question um, about uh, the solutions that you propose to, um, like for example, uh, bariatric surgery or maybe looking into uh, medication. Um, so I'm just wondering, what do you think personally is the better option to do? Because I, it was my understanding that bariatric surgery is quite dangerous sometimes as well, and no? <laughs> no, so bariatric surgery is more safe than having your gallbladder taken out. So the risk of dying is about one in a thousand, and these are usually high risk patients. The surgery itself is keyhole. It lasts 90 minutes. Patients only stay in hospital one night. So, and if you come into hospital on treatments for diabetes today, you go home tomorrow um, off it. But there, there is a, the problem is that we alter how um, micronutrients are absorbed. So the problem is that the patient will need long-term follow-up. So in terms of weight loss, it's very effective, but it does have um, long-term nutritional issues. So people will need to have lifelong follow-up. So yeah. the problem is a person with a BMI 50, at the moment, we have no other option, but the drug that I showed you, semaglutide, 
will probably be a game changer. So in yeah. terms of diabetes, the current NICE guidelines are anybody with a BMI of 35 or more with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes should have an assessment for bariatric surgery. So the problem is it's accessing surgery that's the problem and the government are looking to increase the number of people who can have bariatric surgery because currently there's about 6,000 operations a year. France, which is about a similar population, does 60,000 operations a year that are paid for by their government. So there's a real disconnect between us and France. Yes. So isn't, um, isn't there also a chance of people regaining uh, yes. the weight that they've lost after bariatric surgery? Yes. Yeah, so again, I showed you the variability. So about 20% of people will either not do well or regain weight, but that's biology. Um, with any treat, there's not isn't one treatment that works in everybody. So again, the people who um, don't have a good response, then we can supplement them. At the moment, we supplement them with GLP-1 with loraglutide, and we need. To, it's a bit like treating somebody with cancer. You don't just use surgery. You use surgery. You use radiotherapy. You use chemotherapy, and we're going to need that sort of approach for people with really severe obesity. So polymodal but also exercise is really key after bariatric surgery, which we've got a session on later. Okay, um, I think we have a question. Um, I think John Blundell wants to ask a question. And I think Javier Gonzalez from the University of Bath has been waiting. So Javier, if you go first, and then John, I believe you've got a question. Thank you. Good morning, Thank you. Javier. Good morning, thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, you showed that um, the biggest initial weight loss results in typically the better longer term maintenance. Um, and there's a perception at least that extreme energy deficits um, might not be too favorable, um, at least a perception either from the public or, or from certain clinicians. So I, I wondered uh, what your thoughts were on that and whether that needs to be changed or, um, or not. I think we need to really look at that because my experience from be it pharmacotherapy or lifestyle or bariatric surgery is the nadir is determines everything. So, and also sort of the quicker you can get people down, the more they'll stick with it. So there is an argument for really maximizing weight loss during the initial weight loss period. But the caveat to that is we need to be losing fat mass, not lean muscle mass. So during that time, we really need to make sure that patients are doing resistance exercise and also some aerobic exercise and having enough protein so that we're trying to protect their muscle mass and also calcium. So I think it's an area that hasn't really been looked at, that actually whether during that rapid weight loss, the sort of biological response isn't quite so profound, that we've got this like window of opportunity where maybe we should really maximize weight loss and then that will end up sort of with a lower overall weight later on. Uh, John, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks Rachel for a, a brilliant biological perspective. My question is about the environment. Yes. Because at certain times during your presentation, you did mention the environment to give a, an evolutionary perspective. And also you showed the obesity systems map, uh, which is mainly concerned with describing the environment in which people with obesity live. And there's very little biology in the obesity systems map. So my question is, to what extent can biology produce a solution to obesity without changing the environment which i think we for years and years we've recognized yeah. that it's toxic and that there's a market aggressive market that stimulates consumption and that's going to continue for probably ever so to yeah, what extent maybe. can biology deal with obesity at the population level yeah if it can at all or is it solely to do with dealing with patients so we need to absolutely tackle the environment and the obesity health alliance is really trying to make inroads into that but it is really tricky in terms of the food industry we thought the um tobacco industry had good lawyers uh, the food industry is sort of even more aggressive so we really do and i think if you come at it from right if you come at it from it's a person's right to have access to nutritious healthy food 
then we're in a different place. Um, if, you, if you look at food production, agriculture, food policy, we have an opportunity at the moment as we come out of the EU to make a real impact on sort of the sort of food that is around. And one of the things I didn't cover was um, obviously health inequalities. There are whole swathes of people where food insecurity is a real issue. And if you really only have a couple of pounds to feed your family, are you going to try and choose something healthy? Or are you going to choose something that you know that they're gonna eat, such as a packet of sausages and chips? It's not that people in poverty don't understand what's healthy, it's just that they can't actually access it. So really tackling health inequalities, I think is really key. If we think the number of um, children who are living in food poverty, it's, it's just shocking when you look at how much we've just contributed to additional defence. Um, we can afford war, but we can't afford to feed the poor, I think was the strap line that I read yesterday. David, Chloe's been waiting for a while. I don't know whether you can see no, her. I haven't seen thing. that. So, Chloe, please, please go ahead, Chloe. And Thank you. Hi, Rachel. Thanks for your talk. Um, just a quick question uh, regarding childhood obesity. I know you mentioned, um, obviously, the, the pharmacotherapy uh, as a solution um, to sort of, as you say, regulating the obesogenic environment. I was just wondering, your sort of, um, has there been investigations regarding um, sort of pharm pharmacology to childhood obesity and if, if there's been any sort of recent development on that? So just to touch on children, so the levels of overweight and obesity in 11 year old children in the UK are worse than in the US. So we've got one in five of our 11 year old children living with obesity and services and provision for children is just terrible actually. Adults is bad enough but children is just a desert. Um, in terms of treating children um, with obesity, so loraglutide, which is the, the sort of first generation GLP-1, there is there's a paper that came out showing that it does work in um, children. But again, there's always a concern to do with using pharmacotherapy in children. I think that there is a planned study for semaglutide, but at the moment, again, it's just prevention of obesity in children has to be an absolute priority and also starting to treat the children but again, it's how you do it without um, increasing stigma. So the whole childhood weighing system and weighing children in school actually generates more stigma, which then drives further obesity. So it's how we do it in a much more friendly uh, way, effective, that then doesn't stigmatise the children and cause bullying. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, I think we've got one more question from a colleague of mine, Chris McLeod at Loughborough, and then we can go for the break. So, Chris, go ahead. Hi, Rachel. Uh, thanks so much for that amazing talk. Really, really good. Um, uh, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about semaglutide. It's really uh, exciting, as you say, finding that you, that, you, that you have, and it's only an abstract form. Um, just wondered how long did it take for the 15% reduction in weight to occur? Um, and who would you recommend it for at the moment? Which sort of category of, of obesity? Um, and, and is there any suggestion that more than 15% would occur if you carried on with the supplementation or with? Yeah, with the so drug? the STEP program is Nova Nordis's very large comprehensive phase three program where I've shown you some of the data, but not all of it's available. Melanie, who's uh, Professor Davis, who's also, um, at this workshop, she's a PI on some of the studies as well. So the main sort of promise of semaglutide, so it's a once weekly injection, and it mimics the action of GLP-1, is that the vast majority of people will achieve double digit weight loss with it. And also a large number of people will get 20% weight loss. So that's reaching bariatric surgery levels. But the thing that you have to remember is that it's like treating high blood pressure. You can't stop the treatment. So we know that if we stop it, then people will put weight back on. So that's one of the issues. So who should we be using it in? Well, it always comes down to cost, efficacy and side effects. So we know that it's effective and we know that it's safe. The big problem will be what the cost ends up being if you think that we've got 28% of the population 
who are living with obesity, then actually giving pharmacotherapy to 28% of the population isn't an option. So that's where the scoring system, so the EOS score, when we look at the impact of obesity on a person's health, comes into it. And what we don't want to do is say everybody has pharmacotherapy, because actually for some people, lifestyle can make a massive difference. So it's that stepped approach. So you start off with um, lifestyle intervention, with behavior therapy and physical activity, then do add in. The caveat to that is obviously if, you, if I see a patient who's got a BMI of 50, then I'm not gonna start with lifestyle intervention because they're at a different stage. So it's basically selecting where along the sort of treatment paradigm your patient is. But as more drugs become available and the cost comes down, then I think it will make a big difference. So the data should be in terms of the proper papers. So step one is under review at the moment. And I think many of the others are. So hopefully early next year, we'll actually have the proper um, papers published. Thank you, Rachel and Chris. So that's almost spot on time. So we're, we're now going to have a break until um, 10, uh, sorry, 10.35, um, when we'll, 11, we'll come 11, back. 11.35. Um, 10.37 now, David. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, <laughs> I'm already lost. <laughs> <laughs> too, many screen, too many screens in front of me. We're going to take a break to 11.05. Um, I think people can stay logged on, is that right? Carolyn, just mute, mute your, turn off your videos and mute your screens and we'll yeah. see you all again at 11.05. Enjoy your coffee or tea. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. See you shortly.